David, what's up, man? Glad to be sitting in this hotel room with you. Oh, I'm glad to have you here, man. It's an honor. I, I know. Uh, I know you've been busy. What? This is the the. Uh, well, I think we're wrapping up your podcast tour now, right? It is. You are the last one I'm doing, man. I'm over this shit. Yeah, how's it been? It's been just insane with a book launch, or what? You know what? It's it's uh, been overwhelming for me. Uh, people may think that I'm this extrovert guy now because I've been trying to get this book out there, but out of everybody with you know like like them with their books, I think I probably took on the least amount of podcasts. I think we turned down over 200 podcasts. Um, I was getting them left and right. And I'm like, you know what, man, if you buy the book, you buy it. If not, I don't give a shit. You know, I'm not going to be out here trying to pump this book on people and people oversell themselves too much, I think, in life. And that's just not me, man. If, yeah. If, if, if you like it and you hear about me through word of mouth, Merry Christmas. If not, man, so be it, man. You just don't, you don't hear about me. I think that's, that's probably, we were talking about this earlier, but I think that's a lot of the reason that, that, that you and your message and everything you're sharing resonates so well with people because it is real, right? right. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't feel fabricated. And, and we live in a society where everything from social media and all the filters people are running things through is like, it's so fake <laughs> that it's, it's just a turnoff. And right. so for somebody to come along who actually deals with like real life stuff and then shares that, I think right. it really, really resonates well with people. Well, I appreciate that, man, but that's, that's exactly who I am. That's what I'm not about. People go, hey, how come you don't post more? Mm -hmm. You know, I post like once a week, if that, because that's not me. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to gain some, you know, some, some stardom or some fame or some shit, you know. I'm out here trying to give you what I learned in my life. And I didn't learn all that stuff, so I can't post every single day. So, you know, I don't have a lot of things to say. If I have nothing to say, I'm not going to say something. Right. So if I have something to say, I'm going to bring it up to your attention. I'll say something that might resonate with you or might not. So, yeah, I'm all about being authentic to who I am. I, I thought it was fascinating that you don't follow anybody either. Right. That's pretty interesting. So the big reason behind that is I'm not on social media. Like, so I post things to the masses. If you want to hear what I have to say, here it is. This is what I'm saying. But I'm not on there seeing how Tom, Dick, and Harry are doing. Right. You know, I spend my time basically trying to focus on how to better myself to continue on my journey to be a better person in life. And all, those, all that time for me is wasted time. So I waste, there's no fluff in my life, man. Every second of the day is being utilized to become a better human being. Do you think there's, I don't know if balance is the right word, but do you think there's, there is a point in time where you can sit back and say, let me take this in a little bit? I, for a long time, was probably the most unbalanced motherfucker on the planet Earth. And I, take, I took great pride in that. Yeah. I, it, was on, it was on purpose. It was on purpose because I knew for me to get to where I wanted to go, where I had to go, there could be no balance. Mm. There, there could be no, well, eight hours a day, I do this. and then, Yeah, no nine to five, no, right? No, no, no. It had to be, I'm such in a fucked up spot in my life. I'm such in a dark place that if I don't dedicate... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year to becoming a better human being, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. And so the people who were in my family had to realize, hey, I'm sorry that you may think I'm neglecting you right now, but if I don't fix myself, I won't be good for anybody. So yeah, I became very unbalanced for a long time. I mean, balance is important, but you have to first go to war with yourself. You gotta figure out what you're about and be proud of who you are before you start to get that teeter-totter nice and balanced out. So Yeah, that makes sense. I think, I think if I'm hearing you right, what I, what I hear is that in order to create maybe some of that balance down the road, you have to get a foundation under you. That's right. right? If you don't have that foundational knowledge of who you are and how you show up and what you're capable of, yeah, it's pretty hard to, to walk in any sort of balance between work and career and family and all the other things that you have going on. That's right. So if you read my book and you see what goes on, you see how many mistakes I make along the way trying to find balance, trying to find peace in myself. And I fucked myself all up. I'm, I'm having relationships. I'm having, you know, I, I get a girl, you know, knocked up. She's pregnant. I'm, I'm in the worst spot of my fucking life. You know, I don't have a real job. I'm going through SEAL training. I haven't graduated SEAL training. I'm going back through SEAL training for the third time. And now I have a girl that's pregnant. I, I'm all over the fucking place. I don't have, you know, I have no money. I have, I have nothing. And I'm, and I'm establishing a life with a family and I'm all fucked up. So, you know, a lot of us get in situations where we start establishing all these different things and pop up all these different pop-up boxes and our life is fucked. Cause we haven't fixed ourselves. You know, until you fix yourself, don't, don't start another journey before you finish your own journey first or, or not finish it, but at least get a good, you know, foot start into it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's a lot of guys actually deal with that because what we've been told is, is our responsibility as men is that we've got to take care of other people, right? We've got, we've got our team, we've got our family, we've got our employees, we've got everybody else that we have to take care of. And then all of that, all of ourselves goes by the wayside, but you can't really sustain that for any, any measurable amount of time if you don't have yourself taken care of. 100%, man. And I fell into that several times, into that whole man thing. Get a family, do this, do that. And I'm, and I'm jacked up. I'm insecure. I have all kind of issues going on. So I'm bringing all these issues into a family. And all that does is destroy your family. Hmm. If you are not the man of your house, like a real man of your house, not like I'm a man because, you know, you have a, a, a cock right. and the balls. No, right. motherfucker. That, that ain't a man. I'm sorry, a man has his shit wired tight. And I wasn't that guy. You know, I, I thought because God made me a man because I pissed standing up that I'm a man. Hmm. No, that ain't how it works, man. Yeah, and, I, and I realized that. I, I realized a whole bunch of times, man, God, God may have given me the wrong shit. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta earn something, man. So I, I, I had to go back to that man mentality and start to earn that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because as I was, as I was, uh, I, I read part of your book and then I listened to a lot of it, and I got to tell you, I put a lot of little, a lot of miles on the trail to uh, to your <laughs> words. So How's that? yeah, not as many as you do, but more than I have in the past. So I do appreciate that. But I was really fascinated towards the end of the book because you talk about uh, some health issues that you were dealing with yeah. and through your stretching regimen. And the thing that blew me away about that is not that you were like, okay, I'm going to stretch, you know, for half an hour or an hour in the morning and get worked out. It was like. I'm six hours a day, 12 hours yes. a day of stretching to get yourself fixed so you can get back in the fight. Yes. So I want to show you something I haven't shown anybody before. Oh no, I don't know. I don't know if it was. No, I'm not going to show you none of that stuff. <laughs> so you see these little spots right here in my oh, body? Oh yeah, yeah. You see this? Yep. So basically, these, everybody wonders what happened. Right. These are very small spots. I look like a leopard. All over. They were all over my body. Really? So just to give you some insight, so I've talked about it on several podcasts, but I haven't shown anybody like my, my leopard skin and what happened. So I can take off my, I, I can show you all kind of nastiness, man, but I'm not going to do that. I can show you my ears and I'll show you one thing right now. This part right here, you see this little dry spot in my ear? Oh yeah, yeah. And if I were to dig in my ear right now, nothing but shit would come out. Really? A whole bunch of crust. I'm taking you there. Why? This is a man show. That's right. That's so right. So we're gonna go there. Let's right go now. there. Okay, we're gonna go there. <laughs> so I don't talk about it on most shows, but what happened was over a period of time of me literally trying to transform myself, and a guy asked me a question yesterday, man. Um, am I paying now physically for what I put myself in? I said, yeah, I am. But what he doesn't understand was I, when I was 297 pounds and I was a piece of shit and I wasn't going anywhere in life. I asked myself that question before I decided to put myself through hell. Are you willing to do it or am I, are you willing to pay the price? Am I willing to do it and I willing to pay the price mm -hmm. after I fucked myself up? I knew for me to get to where I wanted to go, I didn't have the ability. The ability was not there. So I knew I was going to break myself off mm. to do it. Some people are born with this great talent. I wasn't smart. I, I, I wasn't some physical specimen. I wasn't into that stuff. So I knew for me to go through all of this shit. At the end of it was going to be a broken, broken man. So I did it. And in the process of doing it, I knew all along the way, I'm going to be fucked up one day. And that time came. That time came. And in that book, that so as muscle I'm talking about, right. literally for me being in that fight or flight mode and pushing and pushing way beyond what I thought was even possible. I kept on finding new and new and new limits as I was going on this journey. So, but in doing that, you're breaking your body down tremendously. Sure, yeah. So what happened to me was my, that psoas muscle attached to your lower body, your upper body. Mine became so fucking tight that it literally left probably, I would say, baseball sized lumps on my hip. And those, so these are my muscles that just tightened up and tightened up up to my hip flexors. And it was just contracting right there? Just contracting right here. So I looked, I had two, two fucking lumps like this, were right here. And no one knew what the fuck they were. And on the back of my head, I had a big lump on it. And, and you can kind of see it now. Oh, right, yeah, I can. But it used to be an extra inch and a half. Really? So this is where my sickness was coming from. 
So the doctors gave me all kind of fucking medication and slowly but surely I kept on getting worse and worse and worse. No Cause you were going out. through the same type of training at this point or so, were you hung up at this point? So at this time I'd already done like 19 years in the military. Yeah. I had done all these ultra races and all this other shit. So I, I had gone through the gamut, but no one knew that every time I got to the start line of an ultra race, I was fucking broken at the start line. Mm. So I didn't go as ultra race like, oh, I'm healthy, I'm ready to go, I'm all and juiced you up. Feeling awesome. No, I, I went to the start line of every damn race I ever did, broken. A lot of times I went to the start line with stress fractures, compression tape on. If you look at me in that bad water tape, in my first bad water, you can see at the, end of, at, at, at the end of the bad water, there's a video before I get interviewed, and they're taking off the compression tape. I had that in the start line, damn Rex. You started with so that. So my mentality was was garanimalistic. It was it was it was something that that it was it was barbarian type of men, like like a mentality. So but that cost me. It cost me a lot. But um, and that's what happened to my body. My my body slowly started to uh, literally choke itself out. So I lost two inches of my height due to that psoas muscle that's attached to your T12 just gripping down. So what you see here, all these little leopard spots on my body, is basically, as I started opening my body back up, infection and shit started coming out everywhere. So I got to the point, and I hit it from the SEAL teams for a long time. The last two years as a Navy SEAL, I couldn't balsava, which is clearing your ears to go underwater. Yeah, that, yeah, that depth was probably tough. But definitely. luckily, we, drive, you know, we, we were diving dragger systems, so you only go down like, like, like 15, 20 feet. But still, at 15, 20 feet, you still got to equalize and you know and get your you know Valsalva. So I was literally just busting my eardrums out to go down because all that earwax that's now coming up, I got so tight, my traps and everything shut off my eustachian tubes. So whenever the doctors would go, they go, "Hey, doc, I cannot clear my ears." They would go in and check my eardrum, and they'd be like, "You have the cleanest ears I've ever seen in my life. I'm, you don't have any earwax." Hmm. Why? The shit was trapped and cut off. Uh, so the second I opened all this shit up, and my fiance will tell you it's the grossest fucking shit, it just comes out like for two and a half years now. Because it's been backed up and in then there. It's just, it's a, it's a sick, it's, and then the, the leprous spot, so I, I open something up, and infection. It's, 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 it's something that I could write a whole fucking book about, but now after five years of doing this shit, I am uh, in the best shape of my entire life because my body, even going into SEAL training, because my, my childhood was so messed up yeah. and that psoas muscle starts to get tight then, that I went into SEAL training really out of shape or as far as my health. Sure. And I just, I, I would tape it up. My mentality was tape it up, man. I, I just taped it up and kept on going in it and I paid the man, but it was worth it. So yeah, well that's what I was gonna ask you. Was it worth it? Obviously it was, you're saying that is now, but but uh, what what makes it worth it? When you look in that mirror for so long and you're lying to yourself and you're lying to people, because I grew up in such a hostile environment for my dad beating the shit out of me. When you don't know right from wrong and you're just getting the shit kicked out of you because your dad's an alcoholic and all he does is beat you to death because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, you don't know up from down, right from left, right and wrong. And you grow up in this very misguided way of thinking. Um, all you want to do is change your circumstances. And, and in that circumstances, your mom is in that also. So your mom, who's a good woman, you see her start to change. She starts to get lost in the violence of my father. So now you're in this hell hole and this is where you live and this is where you exist. So now to find myself, there was no mentors for me. There was no one that said, hey, this do is this. how you do this. You know, I pretty much skipped all of school. I cheated all through school. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. It was like having a kid and putting that motherfucker in the sewer and saying, I hope you fucking come out one day. Mm. That was my mentality. So I had to literally talk about, you know, a man. I had to make a man in what I thought a man was supposed to be in my mind. I created where I thought a man was supposed to be in my mind. And that's what I started doing. So I looked at myself in the mirror and when I looked at myself in the mirror, man, I wasn't proud of who I was. And I, and I kept on backsliding and backsliding. And I made the decision 
And I was 297 pounds. I gained 125 pounds. I was 175 to 297. Had, had left the military, left the Air Force, and I was working for Ecolab, making thousand dollars a month. I was at the bottom of the fucking barrel. I I become exactly what life had made me, and what I had made me too. I said, I, I'm gonna die trying. Mm. I don't give a fuck what it does to me. I don't give a fuck if I break myself off. I don't care if I lose legs. I don't care if I have stress. I, I don't care what it is. I don't care how much pain I go through. I don't care, but this reflection in the mirror will change, or I will die trying. I will die. I will not look at this guy in the mirror anymore because I can lie to you right now. I go back to that mirror every fucking night, and I usually shave my head almost every damn night, and I got to sit there for fucking 15 minutes and look at myself in the mirror. And that reflection is telling me every fucking thing I'm not. And it starts to, some of us are allowed to go away from that. I was haunted. Mm. Every day, 24 hours a fucking day, this voice would be in my head. Hey, motherfucker, you ain't shit. This is what you're going to be the rest of your life, man. To the point I said, you know what? I'm going to break myself off, man, trying to fix this person. So that's, that's why it's worth it. Because now sitting in front of you today, I earned I earned the right to be broken. And people go, man, what, what does that mean? Every scar, every wound, every broken bone, every issue I had, even all these fucking little marks come my body, it comes from sacrifice trying to become someone. And I'm not saying do what I did. My life took me down a journey that almost forced me to propel myself to where I went. And it was worth it. This is a. This might be a weird question, but are you? Do you? Are you grateful for those times? You know, the, the the times with your father, all the hardship, all the trial. Like, how do you view that stuff now that you feel like you've overcome that and become something new entirely? Honestly, man, I'm I'm very grateful for it. I'm I'm, I'm more grateful for that than being a SEAL, going to Ranger School, anything ever done in my life. My so people always go like like you know they they come to my house and I've done so many races and so many different things. I don't have an I love me wall. Hmm. You walk in my house, it's like, you, you, you see the decorations on the fucking wall of what my fucking fiance has done. There ain't, there, there's nothing about me. And they go, why is that, man? You've done so much in your life. Man, all this shit up here is priceless. Like everything I've gone through, all this, like, like, like the journey of my life has been something that I can, I can never ever be able to say enough about. You know, it, it is who I am. You know, like everybody wants to be proud of themselves. When you finally become proud of yourself, you no longer give a flying fuck what it took to get there. Mm. And that's what people always say, man, look at you, man. You know, you have all this stuff happen to your skin and your body's broken, this and that. The feeling I have in my mind is priceless. And it's not going to say you have to do it over again to get this feeling again. I do it all over again. You would. All over again. Interesting. With a smile on my face. That, Roger that. That's awesome. Over again. Where so where this uh, where this idea of you know creating a the, the type of man that you wanted to be come from? Because you didn't you didn't have that, no. right? You you didn't have some model of oh this is what I aspire to be like. Right. So where does did you create that craft that in your mind, or were there influences that came into your life? It honestly came from I was a big time movie guy. Mm -hmm. So we had no money. We lived in a seven dollar a month place growing up for a long period of time until my mom finally got enough money to move out. My best friend, his name is Johnny Nichols, growing up. His parents had two VCRs, so they would go to the blockbuster, whatever the fuck it was called back then. Yeah. Get a movie, and they would fucking illegally record, take, record the movie. <laughs> so I would come over there. And I would go to Johnny's house and every fucking Sunday and Saturday, they had, they had like fucking a thousand movies, man. <laughs> and I would go over there and start watching movies. That's what I did. They would be home, I'd walk in the house, start watching fucking movies. And one of the movies I watched was Rocky. And I got obsessed with Rocky and I got obsessed with Platoon and Rambo and all those fucking kind of war movies and sure. shit, Predator yeah. and shit. Yeah. And I saw all these fucking badass guys. And uh, one scene that particularly, I probably, I probably broke his damn VCR trying to watch this one scene. One scene that changed my life, it was only 2 minutes and 13 seconds, I, I believe around there, was Rocky 1, round 14. I talk about it all the fucking time, but it literally fucked me up. Like, you know how, you, how you're watching something, 
and you get this weird feeling over yourself, like, God, dog, that was fucking special. Mm -hmm. And you and you get chills, and you get kind of almost emotional, you get kind of choked up in your throat. So um, basically, man, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm real young, real young, going through all my hardships, just left Buffalo, New York, my dad beat the shit out of me, and I, I have nothing. And um, never had this feeling before of, of watching inspiration. I didn't know what inspiration was. Yeah, I didn't know I what any of that shit was. I, I just knew like, you know, just pain and suffering and shit. So when I saw this guy who was Rocky getting knocked down and getting knocked down and getting up, so I, I was intrigued. So I sat back and watched it a little bit more. And Apollo was supposed to be the best person in boxing and he knocks this fucker down in the corner. And what brought my attention was that it was like a perfect storm for me was the music was perfect. Mm. It was a perfect scene for me to like almost gain strength. And I, and I see this guy in the corner who, who, who reminded me of me, guy couldn't read, talked off, fucked up, you know, just kind of this dumb boxer. But he had something that I wanted. And uh, Mickey was saying, his trainer was saying, stay down. Right. And he didn't hear anybody. He didn't give a fuck. All this guy wanted to do was go to the distance. He didn't want to win. He's wanted to be able to go to distance. And when he stood up, you know, off that, off, off of getting knocked down for like the 30th time, and I'll never forget the look when Apollo Creed finally thinks he won. His back is turned to Rocky as Rocky's getting up and as Mickey's saying, stay down. And once Apollo turns around, he looks at Rocky, that he's now standing up in the corner. And the referee is standing beside Rocky. Rocky's like, hey, you know, man, I'm fucking good. And when Apollo turns around, the look on this massive man who's the best boxer in the world, his face is just distraught. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck are you, man? And when he's, he's kind of wobbling in the corner, he's, he's all fucked up, but he's, he's like, no, man, not today. I just want to go against the best. I want to know that I am somebody. And he gets his gloves and he motions them back over. And Apollo's face, you know, he, he like puts his face down and he shakes his head. And I'm like, that's what I want. Mm. That's what I, that's what I want. So that scene was like, that's how I want to feel. Cause I was almost Rocky. I could feel how he was feeling. I know the pride he had to feel by motherfucker. I'm, I stood up again. Right. And the pride he had to feel after going 15 rounds with the best person. He didn't win, but it wasn't about that. It was the fact that for the first time in his life, he knew he was something. He was somebody. He wasn't just some old bum from the street, as he said. And I wanted that feeling. So I knew to get it, I had to train. Something like Rocky did, but even harder, because this was a real situation for me. This was real life. So I started to create the real Rocky. Hmm. I wanted to be the, the, the real version of a movie. And, but that's the hard part, though. That movie's inspirational. And in my life, there's a lot of times in my life where it wasn't so inspirational. There's a lot of lonely moments where there was no going the distance song in the background to keep me going. Yeah, that music changes no. things, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. lack thereof. Or the lack thereof, man. There's a lot of times, there's a lot of quiet times, a lot of failure, a lot of disappointments, a lot of starting from scratch. But that's when I started to develop a different mentality. Mm. And I started to develop a mentality of this is where it's at. Where you find out where you're at, is when you're at the fucking lowest part of your life. So I started to develop a whole new mindset. Like the lowest part of my life used to make me feel bad. The lowest part of my life now, it actually gives me strength because I know so many people stop. Mm -hmm. That's where they quit. Right. When, when they get to the fucking sewer of life versus looking at it saying, oh yeah, motherfucker, now let's see what the fuck is up. <laughs> let's see what the fuck is up now. Let's see the millions of men out here in this world they're not going where I'm willing to go now. This is where people stop. And this is where I started to develop the different mentality is, you wanna test my resolve? You wanna test my ability to go to the distance? You wanna see where your life ends and mine begins? That's where that mentality started for me. Hmm. Cause I started saying, man, you always end up in the dungeon. You gotta find strength in that motherfucker where no one else does. So that, that Rocky movie was a little bit of a spark, but to become that person, it takes a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see. Do you feel like, uh, like you're, I don't know, having a chip on your shoulder, maybe, or be, being beat down enough where you thought, you know what, screw this, like screw everybody else, I'm gonna show them, or is it from someplace different than that? 
It used to come from having about 400 million chips on my shoulder. Yeah, I bet. I yeah. had a lot. I and think, I think a lot of people probably read you and think, oh, this guy's angry. Right? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't read that, but I right. think that's probably what people oh, yeah. think. I, you know what's funny about me, man? I have zero anger. I'm a passionate guy, so I, but I get it though. Sure. The yeah. way I talk, the way I come across, I'm an aggressive guy because that's what it takes to, like, if you walk into a situation, into a fight, I'm not saying be so aggressive that you're, that you're so aggressive that, that, that you're making bad moves. Sure. But if you don't have a little flame burn in you knowing that I might get fucking hit real fucking hard, and when I get hit, I have to attack. I have to, I have to, I have to bring, I can't get knocked out. Right. Right. You have to have that mentality of, when I went to Hell Week, I knew I was going to get broken. I had to have an internal flame in me that can never be, it, it couldn't be kindling. Kindling, you put the water in the fucking kindling, that fucking shit's out. Right. Yeah. Nah, I had to be a motherfucking tree that is burning hard. It's burning for a long fucking time. And that's what I became, man. So it's not anger. Anger can't sustain you for a long period of time. Because once you get in a situation, try, trust me, I tried it before. When you get in a real hard situation and you're miserable, miserable, that anger is gone. Mm. What comes up is real. The real feeling of who you are and where you're at, you don't want to care about the people who made fun of you in high school or your dad beating the fuck out of you. Because now you're, you become selfish. You're like, let's say you're in hell week, you're in that cold fucking water, it's 50 fucking degrees, and, you're, and your balls are in your fucking mouth right now. You're sitting there thinking, oh fuck, dude. Like, your mind's not thinking, those fucking kids in high school bullied me or my right, dad. Right, that's no. the least of your worries. No, you're thinking, so that anger can fuel you for so long. There has to be something so deep in you that drives you. So, what, what really does it for me is I know what we're capable of. And I know that most human beings aren't willing to go where I am. Mm. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. I'm not saying I'm bearing anybody else. Everybody has this talent. Sure. It's not a talent. It's just realizing that we stop way short of our true potential. So through my life, I realize these things. And I know what gives me fuel is I know that most people who are blessed with so much talent, great parents, great upbringing, didn't come from where I come from. They're going to quit before me. Having all the tools that they have, they didn't have the ability to examine themselves. When you have everything so nice in life, it's, it's great to have a great life. Yeah, no doubt. But what happens is you don't self-examine. You don't do a live autopsy. When you have a fucked up life, it almost forces you to do a live autopsy. It forces you to find strength from places that no one looks from. Because food is not at the ready. You know, your me, I have a learning disability. It's not at the ready. I can't just pick up a book and start reading. Right, right. There's, there's preparation behind everything I fucking do. There's, there's, everything I do has to come with so much fucking preparation. It's despicable. It makes me sick. My own personal life makes me sick. That's why I'm so disciplined now. Without my self-discipline, there is no David Goggins. Mm. Like, I can't, like, stop reading. I won't be able to read tomorrow. It will, I will lose it that fast. Wow, yeah. You know, I, you know, I cannot stop going to the gym. My mind is set up in a spot where, hey, the second I stop, it wants to stop. Mm -hmm. Because I had a quitting mind growing up. When you get beat the shit out of you all the time, your mind wants to go to that nice spot where you're comforted, where you're not trying, where shit is easy. That's where your mind, it doesn't want to think. You have all these things in the mind, and, and the mind can only absorb so much shit. So all the pain that has to go through, it, does, it wants to push it away and say, let's not do that. So every day I'm fighting where the mind wants to go. So it's a, it's a, it's a, constant, it's a constant evolution, man. I'm, I've never arrived. I've never, I'm, I'm kind of, that's right now, I'm stressing out two, three hours a day. Every, I'm, I'm trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm like, oh man, I went through Navy SEAL training being fucked up. I ran over 7,000 miles in 2007 being fucked up. I did pull-up records being fucked up. Now that the mind is so fucking strong, let the body catch the mind. So that's now where I'm at. So I'm always trying to reinvent the wheel and see what I'm capable of next. 
Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's an interesting point. So what most people would look from the outside is they say, oh, this is a guy who has it figured out, he's got it dialed in, he's achieved X, Y, and Z. And what you're saying is, you don't even fully believe that you've reached your capacity. I haven't even touched 50% of it yet. Mm. Because I didn't realize until I got so sick, how sick I was going into some of the hardest things in the world. When I, when I realized how tight my body was Cause you know, I, I didn't, I didn't bitch about shit. Right. I didn't go through like, you know, like when you're going through SEAL training, you don't sit back and say, Hey man, do you have this problem? Do you have that problem? You know, hey man, I'm having a tough time just getting my leg over the fucking cargo net. Cause literally my abductors were so fucking tight. How I ran was like, I took like steps like this big. Oh yeah. I wasn't like striding out. My shit was fucked up. I mean, I would, and so at that time I was 24, 25 years old. I was literally spitting in the Gatorade, a 64 ounce Gatorade bottle at nighttime. I would drink it. And then at nighttime, I would hawker up these brown fucking loogies and the bottle would be halfway full by the time I got up at four o'clock in the morning to go back to work. I figured everybody was doing this. Right. No, the inside of my body was all fucked up. I was definitely ill. I would, I'd be swimming in the fucking ocean. This, this, this coughing, I had double pneumonia all through, I was fucked up. I thought everybody had this. No, not everybody was that fucked. I had stress fractures. Why did I have stress fractures? Because my body was, it was so tight in my hips that it was forcing my body to go in. Oh, yeah. And I was putting pressure all on the inside of my body. So I lived with stress fractures. So I had to tape up my body, tape up my shins, tape up shit. You don't go through, so I went through training this way. I was so fucked up. Issues with my fucking abdomen, and issues with my fucking growing, and all kind of messed up issues. So I realized I went through training, 100 mile races, 200 mile races, pull up records, all on the mind. It wasn't a physical thing I had. I was broken, literally broken at the start line of everything I did, including Navy SEAL training, Ranger school, everything I did in the military, I was fucked. But I didn't sit back and say, hey man. So no one knew. Right. No one knew. Yeah, because you weren't talking about it. I wasn't talking about it. And this is really the first time I really talked about it. So I basically realized, my God, man, at the sickest time of my life, I realized, my God, I was so fucked up the entire time. So now the mind is so powerful. I figured that out. Sure. Now, if I can get this body all stretched out, opened up, get all my organs working properly. Now let's see at 44, let's see what can really happen. Yeah. So you're just getting started then. That's the mentality right now, man. So. Yeah. What separates somebody like yourself? Because, I mean, let's be honest, you're, you're not the only one who's dealt with serious hardship in your no, life. No, not at all. But what separates somebody like yourself who's managed to rise above it and somebody who takes the same type of hardship and uses it to play a victim card or a pity party and go cower in the corner? Right. It's how you look at it. And I looked at my shit was this is the perfect training ground to being a man. Hmm. You know, a lot of people, like I was talking about taking the path of least resistance. I believe in life, you must earn the right to be called a man. And a lot of people do not think the way I do, and that's fine. I'm not asking to be David Goggins. Trust me, it's a hard fucking road to home. It's not <laughs> fun. Like it. It's not fun all the time. But the thing about it is, you have to look, I, I looked at my hardships as challenges. Once I got over the pity party, because I went through that phase. Of course. I'm a normal human being. But I realized that that got me exactly where I was at, even worse. As I looked at those challenges the way most people do, woe is me. Why the fuck can't I get a break? Why? I wish I was better. I wish my parents were better. I wish I had a better education. I wish this. I wish that. They have all these wish sandwiches. I started realizing how can I fucking figure out how this shit can fucking work for me? So the one thing we don't do is we don't, when we're in that dark place, that dark place is a great learning environment. If you can sit back in a dark place and find quiet to just think, there's so much power in your failures, in your fucking, in, in your suffering, because why? You're still alive. Mm -hmm. You're still fucking here. So you gotta look at that shit as my God, man, this is power, man. Like now I gotta flip this shit. How many men will be able to do what I'm about to do, what I'm about to try to do? Like literally, 
What gave me strength was when I was at the worst of my worst, how many men would even fucking say they want to try to be a Navy SEAL right now? Yeah, very few. If any. I'm at the worst spot of my life. Like, I can't even walk down the street, let alone run down the street. And I'm going to now call a recruiter up and try to be a SEAL. There's a lot of power in that. But people don't see it that way. They see it, man, that's stupid. Did you believe at that point that you really could? Or were you being, do you feel like, I don't know, over-aspirational? Or did you like genuinely believe I could do this at that point? I genuinely believed I could do it. And the reason why, because I had this voice in the back of my head that I kept on running from. I was afraid of the water. I was afraid of dealing with things that made me feel unaccepted. Mm. I didn't accept myself. So I kept on going towards things that I felt good. Let me, let me go this way. But something kept on saying, motherfucker, you, you have it, man. You got it, man. But you're going to have to fail a lot. But you have it. And like I said, that, that voice kept on haunting. But that voice kept on saying, if you face it, you realize it's not that bad. What, what, what do you think that voice is? I, mean, I, I always, to me, it's God. Yeah, I know you've talked about that a little to bit. To me, it's yeah. God. And um, I don't get off on the whole spiritual tangent. You know, I, I, I don't push that on anybody. I don't care what you believe in. But if you think you're the only motherfucker out here, just, just chilling out and there's nothing. I, and I don't know what God is. I, no one does. I, I, I don't know anything about it. But I know there's something that is above David Goggins. There's, there's too much energy in this world. There's, there's too much. Trust me, I've experienced it, man. There's too much energy, and, and people call it God, you call it what you want. There's something out there that if you can tap into more than yourself, that, that there's something out there that, that, that truly exists, that if, if, if you're able just to let yourself go there, it truly exists, and that voice has been in my head, and whatever it is, it's been there, and I didn't want to listen to it, because listening to it was painful. Hmm. Listening like, to it, so? because it drove me to my fears. Mm. It drove me to my insecurities. It drove me to my lies. It drove me to the spot that made me feel self-doubt. And I didn't want to go there. It drove me, it, like, hey, over here in this pile of shit where everything is at, you're gonna find the true meaning of your life. But I'm like, over there is all the bad shit. I don't want to go over there. Right. Like I, I don't want to. I don't want to go like 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 my dad's over there. The people didn't like me over there. I'm over there. All that shit is over there. But once you go over there and start to re-examine that shit and start to master what you're afraid of, it's unbelievable, man. Like I wish to God the only way I can really describe it is if I can get my brain and put it in someone's head and say, "All right, motherfucker, just shut the fuck up and just here." I can't explain it well enough. But here, I'm not super fucking man. Just, this, look, this is what happens. Because basically, what's over there is victory. It's all fucking victory. But you have to have the balls and the fucking courage, man. And that's the hard part. There's no science behind this shit. There's no fucking practice. Literally, you have to have the balls to go in your own life, in your own shit, and once you go in there and you're able to face and able to talk about it, you're now in the even playing field with everybody in the world. I don't give a fuck where you come from, how much money your parents have, how much money you didn't have. If you're able to handle yourself, know what you're about, know what you're made of, know how fucked up you are, you are now on an even playing field with the world. So once I did that, all these people who have more money than me, where they came from, had great parents, and they're like, oh my God, I caught all you motherfuckers. That quick, because all the money, all the surface things go away, because we all are human beings. Right. That money and shit, all that material shit doesn't matter. It's what's deep inside of the core of your soul that fucking matters. And that's what I realized, man. I, I, I leveled the playing field out, but I had to go over there and face that shit first. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I've experienced that to some degree in my life is that we all deal with the same insecurities, right? Right. The insecurities I'm dealing with are the same insecurities that you're dealing with. That's right. And yet those people who have never had the courage to go step into those insecurities, they may just be operating from a position of talent or a gift or some fortunate event that happened in their life. And so when hardship comes to them, right. they're inadequate or they can't fully overcome that hardship because they've never had to deal with it before. That's they right. didn't voluntarily go into it. Exactly.
Hmm. Exactly. Do you feel like going back to Rocky, do you feel like there was a moment where you said, I am Rocky? Like I have, I have made it this 14th round? Um, or are you still trying to get there? Oh no, man. I, and I'm not, I'm not one to kiss my own ass because obviously I tell myself how fucked up I am. But I'm also believing you have to give yourself credit when credit's due. And I became that fucking movie and then some. Like, if you look at the Rocky movie, and I look at it now, and it's still inspirational, that, that scene still brings back those, those moments. Uh, I saw a Rocky train in the movie, but I see what I went through in real life. That, that movie's a fraction. That all those movies I watched that inspired me, they're all fractions of the real work I put into my life. And I don't ever talk about it enough. The amount of work I put into being who I am, I don't have enough time in the fucking day. Like, I don't talk about it. I don't, I don't brag about it. it. No one even knows about it. Like, 99.9% .9 of the shit I did to get to where I'm at today was alone. Mm. Alone. Out there running in cold and heat suffering in pools trying to swim at home in a fucking room by myself trying to teach myself how to read and write how to study you know no one saw that shit there was no video camera there was no podcast there's no who's david goggins right. what that fucking no, no documentary there was no docu fucking memory that shit <laughs> it was me i just just for me trying to get in the military which everybody can do it's easy just trying to learn how to read and write was something that blows Rocky away. So all these different challenges that I've been through in my life, I've, I've easily, you know, I don't, I don't look at that movie the same way because I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I created, but I'm more proud of I created it without an audience, without a cheering squad, without someone like, you know, like you run the Boston Marathon and people love that race. They run so fast because for 26.2 miles, there's a motherfucker this, come on, man, you got it, you can do it. You know who you are when there's no motherfucker out there when you're running. And you're at mile 75, 150 mile race, ain't nobody cheering for you. You're broken, you're fucking defeated. It's you and you alone in your fucking head. And I stayed that way for the better part of 30 fucking years trying to figure this shit out and once you figure it out you look at your everybody's like, hey so you're all broken now you know is that how you want to be yep hmm yep if you can feel if i could put my brain in your fucking head you said the same fucking thing you would no longer think i was fucking crazy you no longer think i was sadistic you realize motherfucker this guy found it he found it. We're all looking for this feeling. We're all looking for this feeling. And people look at me because I don't always smile and I'm not always jovial sure, or that yeah. bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> nah, man. Don't get it twisted, dude. People see, oh my God, if you look in his eyes, you see like almost an emptiness. People say that about you? Oh, yeah. That I'm, actually surprised me because oh, for yeah. the minute I walked in this room, I saw something different. Because you understand. Hmm. So many people who are judging us don't understand. They, they don't want to look in the eyes of me. They don't want to look in the eyes and study them. What you see in me is fucking real life. That's why people, a lot of people resonate with me because I skip through all the fluff. Mm -hmm. I skip through all the fluff. Right. Fuck that. I can't fluff shit. I can't. Why? I don't know what that is. Life didn't present me with fluff. So I'm expressing to you what I know a lot of us are going through. A lot of us are going through fucking hell. Maybe not as bad as me, maybe worse than me. Sure but they don't know how to express it because we're supposed to live in a fucking world where we have to talk a certain way. We have to walk a certain way, we have to act a certain way. A kinder, gentler world. Nothing gets handled in that fucking world. You stay fucked up in that world. You stay in a world of things will get better because someone said they would and I need to find peace. No, you need to go to fucking war with yourself, man. At the end of that fucking war, you'll sit back all damaged and bruised and scarred up and fucked up, and maybe your so ass muscles so tight that you may lose two inches on your fucking body. Who knows? But then that fucking war, you're gonna sit back on a couch, maybe have a fucking glass of water. If you drink a beer, you drink a beer. 
The war may be 30 fucking years, but when it ends, you will know what the fuck it's all about then. And then you'll find your fucking peace. You'll find your fucking peace then. But until then, you'll always be searching to find that nice, kind book that guides you beyond all your personal suffering and shit. That miracles your fucking ass to peace. <laughs> it doesn't happen, man. Maybe it does for some people, but you're just scratching the surface of real life. Yeah, I, I don't know if it does. I mean, you're, you're touching on a point that a lot of people don't talk about, and that, and that is just being with yourself. Yes. Right? I mean, you've been with yourself for thousands and thousands of hours suffering through some of the most difficult obstacles that we have ever placed upon ourselves. Right. And I think people are really quick to put themselves around others. A lot of the times I think it's to distract themselves 100%. from dealing with their own reality. But is there value in mentorship? I had a friend and, and he knew you and I were gonna be talking and he said, ask him about mentorship. He doesn't talk about that a whole lot. So I wanna know, is there value? You're talking about the value in being alone. I can definitely see how that's viable. Mm -hmm. But is there value in mentorship? Is there value in coaching? Is there value in these other things as well? There's great value in it, but you gotta make sure it's the right mentor. Mm. You have to make sure that that motherfucker is doing what he's saying. What turns me off, which is why I don't, if I don't do what I say I'm doing, I'm not saying it. So many people now are caught up into mentorship, which is good. Sure. They're it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword. Sure. They're, they're, they're looking for that next motivational person. And everybody now is out there doing this shit. And they even put me in that fuck. I'm not, no. I'm not a fucking... I'm not a fucking role model to you. I'm not trying to be a fucking role model. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what helped me the fuck out. I'm not telling you to be me, to follow me, to do what I do. Don't do that. I'll never say that. Too many mentors out here are mentoring people not fucking living in that shit. Mm. They fucking wake up. They have their fucking podcast. They go out to make their fucking money. They, they, they talk this great shit. They... they they get from what I'm saying, they get from what you're saying, they get from what somebody's saying, they flip it in some fucking way and they fucking package it out and they sell it to people. It's a bunch of shit, why? Because they're living the high life, they're living the good life, they're getting paid high, and they're not fucking putting in the work. They're not putting in the fucking work. So you, so you be a mentor a lot of times by a fucking liar. Mm -hmm. Somebody who read a book on who it. Who read a fucking book on it, or who had a hard time, who had a hard time for a little bit, Learn a little bit from something, and, I, and I'm going to fucking sell it out to people. Mm -hmm. No, nah, man. If you're living that, you have to live that way. You have to live in the grind of life. I'm, I'm not saying live in the hard times of life. Work out every day. Better yourself every day. Suffer. Go, go back to a spot that's not so fucking comfortable for you. Just because you made it and you've arrived somewhere, and if, if that's your mentality, you're no longer a fucking mentor. Mm. Yeah, if you've arrived, you it, right? if you, yeah, no, don't fucking mentor a motherfucker. If, if you're happy where you're at, take a few steps backwards and go back to where that one spot that made you, that spot that made me was that time on the couch, I'm sitting with a fucking chalk and milkshake, 297 pounds. I can't go back to 297, but I can go back to how that time felt because that's when I was the hungriest. We lose the hunger and then we go into mentoring people. I'm mentoring you from a nice 72 degree temperature room. Everything is great. I'm making millions of fucking dollars and people are mentoring people. That's great. What did you do today to get uncomfortable? What did you do today to earn that manhood? What did you do today to mentor my fucking ass? What did you do today? I don't give a fuck what you did 20 fucking years ago. If you're not doing it now, stop mentoring a motherfucker. Mm. Retire. And say, hey, young man, I don't know anymore. I'm now comfortable. You need to be in a spot that's hungry. I'm not hungry anymore. If you're not hungry anymore, don't mentor a motherfucker. Yeah. Don't mentor. And that's my, and that's my belief. So, yeah, give somebody some tidbits because you got some knowledge. You know, you're an old guy, got some knowledge. Sure. Yeah. I think there's some, some moral responsibility. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But I believe a mentor is a person that you look at and you say, motherfucker, man, that's what I want to be like. He's 44. He's whatever he is. He still lives it. He talks it. He lives it. A lot of people are talking it. The moral of the story is this. A lot of people are talking it and they ain't fucking living it and they're mentors. Yeah. Bullshit. That's why I'm angry. 
I get angry about that shit. Why? Because a lot of people, man, are living this fucking dream out here, man. I see though, people have, people got my fucking name tagged with these fucking people that I know that aren't doing shit. Oh, Don't man. tag me with a motherfucker like that. <laughs> oh, this guy, I'm not gonna drop names, that's not who I am. Don't tag me with a motherfucker. Don't tag me with fucking anybody. Cause I know for a hundred percent fact that if you talk to me, I got my shit in. And I'm gonna get it in, and when I stop talking, you know one thing. I ain't doing it no more. Mm. I ain't got no more to fucking say because I'm not telling you what I'm doing now. I'm telling you what I used to be. So don't tag me on shit. Fucking, you know, with me and this guy, this guy all helped you out. A lot of guys ain't doing shit. They're fucking reading the book, getting some else's shit, writing about it, and they're fucking your mentor. No, a mentor is a person that's fucking grinding the way you want to grind. Still. Still. Yeah. Today. Yeah. That's just my two fucking cents on that. Uh, that was like three cents, but, <laughs> but man, I like it. I like it. Like the, I, the passion is what inspires me, man, is because, because there is. There's a lot of fake out there. There's a lot of just nonsense, and there's a lot of just regurg regurgitation of the same old stuff. And so I think when somebody comes along who actually has something real to say, you're like, oh, yeah, this is, this is what I need. This is what inspires me. Even though you may not be feeling like you're supposed to be mentoring or are mentoring, I think that inspiration is, is huge for sure. Well, I appreciate that, but it's just real. I, yeah. I like real people. If you're not real, man, shut the fuck up, man. I shut want to talk about accountability mirror. Right. Because in, in going through your book, I thought, man, this is, this is genius. But I also thought and wondered, is there a level where the self-talk, like literally looking at yourself in the mirror and the self-talk become destructive rather than constructive? And where do you find that line? So it's a thin line. Definitely. It's a fucking thin line, man. I, and, I, and I walked it. When I, when I invented the accountability mirror, I walked it hardcore. And you have to walk it. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a world where you have to love yourself. And it's important to love yourself. I'm all about that. You got to... But we also live in a world where if it helps me to help you, I help you. Some selfish motherfuckers. Sure. So, yeah, back to your question. The, the accountability mirror is something that you have to be so real and raw. And you can't talk to yourself in a nice way. But you can't get so bad in that accountability mirror where you get it twisted. And you start putting yourself down mm -hmm. all the time. You got to call yourself for what you are. But you also got to give credit where credit's due in the accountability mirror also. So when I did the accountability, you know, I was like fucking in high school when I did this shit. And I was a fucking character. I was a fucking, I was a liar. I was a character. I was a cheat. It took several years to get out of that, man. I didn't know. And, and I hate to put ignorance on something, but when you're trying to literally invent a man out of nothing, you have a whole bunch of shit to go through, man. Yeah. And I had a whole bunch of shit to go through. It took a lot of years. But I also think, you know, from my perspective, I, just to interject uh -huh. here is like, you know, you talk about cheating, for example, right, mm -hmm. in school. And I think, yeah, yeah, it's cheating, no doubt. But it's also doing what needs to be done oh, yeah. in order to achieve an objective. I was a survivor, my friend. And that's what I'm talking about. Now, is there a better way to handle it? Yeah, probably, maybe. But at the end of the day, you got to get it done. I, I, was the, I was the epitome of getting it done. Mm -hmm. I wasn't proud of how I got it done. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be proud of it. I wanted to earn. I wanted to earn how I got it done. Yeah. That was the thing, man. That's what bothered me. I didn't give a fuck about cheating. I still don't give a fuck. If, if there was a test going on, but the thing about it is now I'm happy that it bothers me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, motherfucker, you should know that shit. You know, you, you need to be the best person in this class. It, based on what I'm hearing you say, it's that it's not your best. Right. It's not my best at all. So back to the accountability mirror, you have to call yourself out for what you are. And at that time, I called myself out. But you also have to be careful for a lot of people getting this mentality of we live in a world a lot of times now where people don't believe they're good enough ever. And they continuously talk about this, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm never gonna be good enough. If that's your accountability mirror, that's not how you do that. Mm -hmm. That's not how yeah, you do that. It's not helping. No. Call yourself out for who you are at that time. Be real with yourself, be honest. And then start to fix that. And change, so the most important conversation is one you have yourself. You have to change that conversation. If you're a negative person, and all you talk about is, I'm not good enough here. That person, that's not how that works. That accountability mirror has two sides to it. You call yourself out 
and you all start to have these small victories. The small victories, don't, don't have this big grandiose, you know, like, I want to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> that, trust me, don't do what I did. I had very limited time to do what I did. So my accountability mirror became huge and grandiose. It's too much for the brain to comprehend. The brain can comprehend if I had to lose 106 pounds in less than three months, which I did, mm -hmm. that's too much. You quit doing that. I quit a hundred times during the process. Just fucking look at it. If your goal is 106 pounds, be happy when you lose a fucking pound. Progress is always about moving forward, not moving back, not staying stagnant, moving forward. Even if it's one small step at a time. I've been stretching out now for almost six years. I take all these steps back, all these steps, but I see that I'm, I'm, I'm going forward. My body's trying to go forward. I'm, I've been patient and patient. Now it's 2019. I've been doing this for almost six years. I'm about to go back to bad water 135. Are you really? It's been since 2014 when I had to drop out for yeah. health issues. Could never get back to the start line. And guess what? Haven't shared this either. I, was, I went from running 205 miles in 39 hours to not being able to get out of bed. When I dropped out of bad water, I went to the emergency room. A couple months later, a few months later, I'm in my bed, not able to get out of my bed. Mm -hmm. The doctors couldn't figure anything out with me, nothing. I sat in the bed and I smiled. I didn't put this in the book. And I went through it all and I said to myself, I'm gonna win bad water. I couldn't even fucking walk. Mm. I couldn't get out of bed, 2014. And my mentality is, I'm gonna win fucking bad water one day. Is that right? And I swear to God, that's exactly what I thought. Versus laying in that fucking bed, thinking this is it. And I thought this was it. I thought that. Sure. I said, man, sure. no one's gonna figure it out. How do you fucking get this sick, man? How the fuck, my, my body's shutting down. My heart rate's all over the place. I'm an AFib, I'm all fucked up. What's going on? I've had two heart surgery. What's, what's, what's wrong with my health? And I sat back after I calmed down, and I, and I stepped back and I smiled. I'm in the bed, I said, you know what? This is it. You can win bad water one day, brother. And what's funny about that, I'm now 2019. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm not saying I'm gonna win a fucking race, but that was my mentality. Sure. And that's the one thing that kept me going and saying, okay, let's stretch out. Let's stretch out. Let's stretch out. We're going to win bad water one day. One day, the race that fucking ended you. The race that you couldn't even fucking finish at the end of it, man. I, I, I've done three of them. I finished three of them. You could go back and win that motherfucker. So that, that's the fucking mentality. From the sewer mentality that you have to fucking have, man. Like, when you're knocked down, you got to be that motherfucker who, whoever knocks you down, they got to be afraid they knocked you the fuck down. <laughs> They'd be like, oh man, this ain't gonna end good for me, dude. <laughs> I made a mistake. I made a mistake knocking this motherfucker down because he's gonna come back. He's gonna come back. That has to be the way you look at life. I may not win bad, but I don't give a fuck about that. It's that mentality. It's that mentality of if you knock me the fuck down, you're gonna say to yourself, I shouldn't have done that to that motherfucker. Mm -hmm. That's the mentality that keeps you in the fight. And that's all it's about, man. This is that uh, the concept of taking souls. That's right. right. That's I love right. that concept. Yes. I think some people might look at that and say, you know, that's a negative way to look at it, or, <laughs> or you know, you, you should you shouldn't want to win at the expense of other people. I, right. I think that's what people would naturally say. Right. But as I was going through this concept and really trying to understand what you were saying, I'm like it's not truly it. No, that's. I mean, this is this is powerful. It's an imaginary game. Right. It's an imaginary game that you're playing with yourself in your darkest moment. You're utilizing people. They don't know that you're utilizing them. Right. And you're not physically manipulating no. people or, or sabotage. That's not what we're talking not about. Not at all. Here. And like you talk about taking souls, I invented that in one of the worst times going through Navy SEAL training. Mm -hmm. So it was Wednesday, and I talked about it in the book. I'm sure you know about it, sure. but for people who don't know about it, I invented taking souls because my soul was being taken from me. I felt the energy being drained from everybody in my boat crew. We had six guys in my boat crew. I felt the energy being drained. It's Wednesday, and on Wednesday, everybody, so, it's, so Hell Week starts on Sunday, ends on Friday. And through rumor mill, they all tell you on Wednesday, man, you're fucked up. 
you're just destroyed. And I've been through three of these motherfuckers, man. So I knew that that's the case. But that's the case because through the years, that was just the pass down. Sure. So you start to create someone else's fucking mentality. Self-fulfilling prophecy. That's right. right. Yeah. This ain't my fucking mentality. I'm what Tom, Dick, and Joe told me. I'm feeling what they said on board. So now you start to feel that way. You're all defeated and shit. So going through my second hell week, I'm realizing, hang on, man. Joe told me this shit. Mm, that's Joe, his ain't, Joe ain't God, this motherfucker. <laughs> Joe ain't God. So this is how I talk to myself, man. I'm like, Joe ain't Goggins, motherfucker. So what you can do now? Your boat crew's all fucked up. How you getting fired up? All right, man. So I'm looking at the instructors on the beach, and they're all fucking, you know, they do eight-hour shifts. They have these instructors, eight hours. They come in, they go. There's three shifts. So they're all fresh, and they're all chilling sure, out. Yeah. Parkers, it's nice and cold out there. They got nice jackets. We're all wet and miserable, sandy and fucked up. They got a cup of coffee, and they're looking at us, just jackhammering. I'm like, these motherfuckers are taking joy in this shit, man. I would take joy in it. But I also <laughs> know that these guys, these instructors are looking at all of us students and they're reminiscing back to when they were us. Of course. And how fucking miserable this time is for them. And they're like, I would never want to do that again. There's power in that. There's power in knowing the human mind. So I'm like, okay, roger that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get inside your motherfucking heads right now. They don't know what I'm doing. So I get my boat crew of five other guys, me making six guys, and the whole evolution now is all you gotta do is just lift your boat over your head, six of us guys, but by this time you're all weak and you're fragile and the boat's coming down. Yeah, it sounds and, easy, right? Yeah, it sounds easy, but on Wednesday, not getting any sleep, the boat's heavy. So now the boat's on your head, it's like, get the boat off your fucking head, and you're trying to pick it up. And this, this is the rhythm. This is the battle rhythm now. Then now they're fucking with you. You're tired, you're a fucking zombie. And now they're playing the fuck fuck games. We got them. We got them. <laughs> the class is cut down in fucking size now. The chinks in the armor. The chinks in the armor. But I'm saying, okay, motherfucker, here we go. I tell my guys, hey, check it out, dude. Follow my lead. Just give me a few seconds. Give me a few seconds of motivation, man. So instead of just having the boat over your head, we're going to start fucking boat pressing this motherfucker, man. <laughs> At the top of the boat press, we're going to loft that bitch. Like, dude, I don't know if we can. Like, just fucking, you can do it, trust me. Just do it for a couple seconds and you'll find strength in it. So, I start yelling, you can't hurt Bo Crew too! Can't hurt Bo Crew too! And my guys start to feed off. So, so like, like, the boat's kind of doing this at first because some guys are in it, some guys aren't. After a while, man, the whole fucking Bo Crew too is fucking. So, Bo Crew too, it goes off your height. Sure, yeah. The tall you are, it's like a height line. Right. So, Bo Crew too, we're the second tallest Bo Crew. And we're just jacking this fucking boat up now, man. And me and my boy, Bill Brown, the front of the boat. And so the front of the boat is the heaviest part of the boat. Okay. And we're just fucking going crazy. And all the other boat crews are just trying to just keep this motherfucker Barely up. On. And we're just jacking it up. Can't hurt us. <laughs> so now we're looking, I'm looking, because they don't know what the fuck I'm even doing. Even my boat crew doesn't know what I'm doing. I'm looking at the fucking instructor's faces. And I can see that they're broken a little bit by the mere fact that it's fucking Wednesday and these guys are supposed to be dead and they're not broken. Mm -hmm. And I saw a look in their eyes, kind of like the look I saw with Apollo Creed when Rocky got up. Yeah. The look of like, the fuck? And I could tell a lot of them respected us, but a lot of them also like, kind of like the hatred, like fuck you, like the alpha male mentality sure. of you're now a little it's bit, a game, it's a contest, that's right. right? You're a little bit better than me. You guys are students, but now we became the instructors. In my mind, this is power in your own mind. This is what I'm thinking, that they're thinking. So then you know, I, I turn around after all that's done, and my boat crew now is fucking jacked the fuck up. And we start just to take over Hell Week again. We lost no races, hmm. 130 hours lost no races, won every fucking race in my second Hell Week, and I turned to my boat crew as we're running out the boats in the head. We're all up in the front and everybody else is fucking smoke behind us. And I looked at them and I said, hey, these motherfuckers will not be having sex for a long time. <laughs> They're like, why is that? I'm like, because we own space. That's we own right, rent. Their head. We own rent in their fucking head, man. We, we, we own a part of their fucking brain. And it may not be true. I don't give a fuck. But in times of need, 
You must find ways to find strength. That's all it is. It's a tool at a time when you need it. Yeah. It's not about hurting anybody's right. It's not about using up. It's a tool. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. I don't give a fuck what they were Doesn't thinking. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I know on Wednesday night of Hell Week you're broken and I wasn't. And I know that something registered in their fucking head. Mm. That's enough for me. And the way you talk about it in the book is, I think if I remember correctly, that that came back to bite you. Maybe just a little bit because then they push harder, right? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll show you, yeah. right? Uh, but again, I think what you're talking about is the, the, the benefits of going that route outweigh the oh. potential punishment of having to, having to do that. 100% because what I found out that happened to me was I rode that high because I knew why. So why I started getting beat even more? I knew why they were beating me more. Mm. So now I knew I really had you. I knew I really had you. So now I even fell off even more. So the more you beat me now, the more I said, you can't hurt me, motherfucker. Yeah. You can't. So I was now like saying, now we're really, so now I didn't fall asleep. I wasn't tired. I never got cold. I wanted you to feel horrible now. Now, now that I see that now you're mad because I rose the level up, and now I see that now you want to beat me harder. Now it's on. Yeah. yeah. So I fed off of that. Man, any man who doesn't feed off of that, question yourself. It, it's interesting because I so I joined the National Guard when I was in high school. Went to basic training when I was just ninety nine, so right out of high school. And some of the advice I got, and and I never really understood it, and I still don't understand it. When people say it today, is they say just blend in. Don't volunteer. Blend right, in. right, right, right. Oh, just yeah. blend in. Oh, yeah. And and to me, I'm like. You know, that might, you may survive because you adopt that. That's right. But at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, that's how you want to live your life? Right. Like, that's how you want to live any element of your life by right. being mediocre so people don't see you? Exactly. That sounds ridiculous to me. People love the gray man. And they tell you that in SEAL training. They tell you that in SEAL I training. Bet. Yeah, I bet. But what's funny about this, I was a 36th black guy to ever make it through in seven years. I ain't blending in regardless. Yeah, there's nothing so, you can do to hide. I was lucky. <laughs> so... I'm, I've, I've been the only, I, I call it the only in my book a lot. So I had no choice. I've been around white people my whole life and I've been the only black guy in every situation. Yeah. So that worked to my advantage and my disadvantage. If I'm walking and being the only person, you better be a bad motherfucker. Mm. Because you can't hide. Right. You cannot hide. Right. So for me, I knew that. I knew that going into every situation, I put myself in those situations intentionally because I wanted to be the guy that just took out like a fucking sore thumb. Here I am. I'm the, only, I'm the only black guy here. How you doing? How you doing? Owned it. Owned it. Owned it. Versus nowadays, we can't even talk about fucking race. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets burned. People wonder why shit's not getting fixed. Why the world, and I'm going on a little tangent right now because it makes me sick. Everybody's so fucking thin-skinned, man. Yeah. Blacks are thin-skinned, whites are thin-skinned. There's no fucking communication. Like, for instance, I'll never forget when I was trying to sell my book. Funniest thing happened. I self-published. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Funniest thing happened, I had a couple of interviews at a couple of publishing houses and, you know, back in the day before this happened. And a couple of people were like, hey, man, you know, you're a black guy with an interesting story, but there's only like 15% of America is black. So they thought that I'm only going to sell this fucking only book to black, black people. people. Like, dumbass motherfucker. <laughs> so I'm sitting there thinking, this is your dumbass mentality. Yeah. 90 fucking percent of the people that follow me are white. Yeah, sure. And they're from all walks of fucking life. Some are fucking from the backwoods of fucking Montana. Some are fucking high scale CEOs. It doesn't matter. It's a fucking communication barrier. We all suffer, man. We all suffer the fucking same. The thing about life is we can't fucking communicate, man. Everybody's so fucking thin. If, if people were to get some fucking alligator skin, problems would be fucking solved. Right. Because you could have the conversations that need to be had. You can go there. Right. You can go there without being offended and being buttered to talk about what happened years ago or centuries ago or decades or whatever the fuck happened. We can deal with what's going on and how we can solve fucking problems. Mm -hmm. How men can sit down, black, white, of all fucking colors, I don't care if you're fucking gay, black, lesbian, whatever the fuck, we can sit down and fix shit. 
You can't fix shit if you as a white man sit back saying, oh man. We can't talk about the this. What the fuck am I going to say with God? His name's fucking black, dude. His fucking guy may go high order, man. He may fucking blow the fuck up. I'm missing something about. So how do I. Do I say black? Do I say African American? Right. What the fuck? That's some of the problems I have with America. We just are so fucking weak that we can't get anything fixed. Because we're so fucking soft, man. So what, what does that require then? Does that require guys like you, guys like me, guys who are listening to the podcast yeah. to be able to have real conversations That's about right. real issues? It's man the fuck up. You're not trying to hurt my fucking feelings. No. You being a white man, you are not trying to hurt my fucking feelings. You are trying to, yes, yeah, some people are. Sure, yeah, there's people out there, no there's doubt. There's people are. When there's people who want to get together and solve problems, you have to go to the ugly places to see what offends you, mm-hmm. what bothers you. You have to say this shit. You have to ask me, hey, David, why do some black people get offended when all I say is this? You have to be able to say it so I can tell you why. Right. And then we learn. And we learn. Without a conversation, there's no fucking knowledge, man, on anything. On anything. If you get your, like me. I'm a black guy. I got my butt hurt all the fucking time. There's a time in my book when I was a junior in high school and I went to all white fucking school. Five black people in my, in, in my school and probably like five black families in all of Brazil, Indiana. I stayed butt hurt. Oh, fucking this. I thought the whole town didn't like me. Mm-hmm. No, there was about 20 fucking racist motherfuckers that didn't like my black ass. So I hated every white person. You lumped everybody in there. Everybody. So I started watching Malcolm X videos and losing my mind on black people. It's got to be black. It's got to be black. If you're not black, fuck you. Mm. The ignorance behind that, the amount of ignorance behind it. I'm not saying the black and white issue, man, but it is sometimes. It becomes that something because of ignorance. We lump everybody into shit because we're not thick-skinned enough to fucking be open-minded to know not everybody's fucked up like that, dude. And nothing's going to be fixed until we fucking get open-minded about the real problems of life. Yeah. Period. We gotta be able to talk about white people have to talk about it as much as black people. Right. And all colors and genders and races have to be able to talk about it. Period. I agree. Well said. Period. I, agree. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here, right? Have these real conversations. Real conversations, man. And, you know, we were, we were talking about this because we did an interview uh, earlier today and we were talking about, you know, talking about the weather, mm-hmm. talking about sports, all the safe stuff. Right? Safe. But you don't talk about Safe. spirituality. Fuck that. You don't talk about race. Fuck that. Or sexual orientation. You'll get blasted. Yeah. Dude, I was on motherfucking Fox News. Black guy on Fox fucking news. Okay? <laughs> That's bad. That's fucking real bad, dude. I fucking I, I might as well be a sellout black guy now. What the fuck? I'm out there trying to fucking promote my book, give a positive message. I don't sure. give a fuck about Democrat, Republican, Independent. I'm a fucking American. We just, we, 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 everything has to be so packaged in it. We, we are so ignorant in this world of how we view things. Everything has to be neatly, like, like you said, safe. Mm-hmm. And, and not only safe, but predictable. Like yes. You as a black man, you have to be a Democrat. Have to be. Have, I have to be. To, I have to be a Republican. That's right. Right. I'm so, glad we're saying this shit because it's true shit. Right. If I'm not a fucking, if, if I walk into most black areas and let's say I'm, a, I'm not a fucking Republican, I'm not shit, I'm Goggins. Let's say, but let's say I am a Republican. That's fucked up for me. Yeah. I'm on the wrong side right now. Right, right. That's fucked up. That's, it, that kind of, th- that kind of shackled mindset, we are shackling ourselves as all people, not just blacks, whites, all of us are shackling ourselves just by that mere fact of just that. Mm-hmm. It's true what you said, but we don't talk about that shit though. Yeah, no way. But it's knowledge. We know it's true. Everybody knows it's we true. We know it's true, but we're not gonna talk about that shit. But that's why when you say things like this, that's why people are, are I don't know about relieved, but they're like, finally. Yeah, you know, like I'm relieved. Something. <laughs> I'm fucking relieved. And so many people, like I see some of these people on TV, man, who say shit that is so fucking innocent. Cause I'm, I'm not thin skinned. Mm-hmm. I want you to say the shit you want to say. Don't hide it. If you have an issue with Black American white issue, talk about it. I want to hear about it. Mm-hmm. People have to. If you say one thing that people take offense to, man, your fucking career's over. 
Just because a motherfucker was intelligent enough to, to know that I can't say this or whatever, because no one talks about anything, man. Yeah. It's just it's just a bad society right now. It makes me sick. It makes me sick for all races, colors, genders. Everybody's so fucking politically correct right now that nothing's getting fucking fixed. Mm. Nothing's getting fixed. That's why I like talking to your white ass. Yeah. Yeah. That I'm a black motherfucker and we're talking about some shit. Yeah. It's great. Agreed, man. And that's what's so powerful about this podcasting platform and the medium and just being able to have real conversations. Real conversations, Sit down man. on the couch and have a conversation. Yeah, judge me, motherfuckers. You're about judge me. Merry Christmas, man. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Go back to your hole and hide. Hide and, and be mad because you can't fucking take a, a conversation with that's trying to help. Mm -hmm. The conversation is going to help the situation. Sure. Because half of this shit's ignorance, man. Like, like that guy about my book. No one's going to buy your book, man. Yeah. I sold 600,000 fucking copies in seven fucking weeks <laughs> and most of it to white people. Come on, man. That has to open your fucking mind that something I'm saying is resonating with a lot of people. And I'm a black guy. Yeah. I'm a black guy from a small white fucking town. Obviously, somebody out here in America, we're missing something here. Right. We're missing something. I don't know all the answers, but we're missing something. So, it's just, it's just funny. I mean, I, I always sit back and I always look at all this fucking shit. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on, man? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of hate, but whatever. Yeah, well, well so the other side of this, though, is when does the, uh, the, the assertiveness become a problem, right? It's because I, I imagine that people are very intimidated by you. Right. A lot of people are probably intimidated by very. you. Very. And so the, the level of assertiveness and confidence that you have that I think people mistake for anger or potentially even arrogance right. turns them off to be able to have a conversation. I know you dealt with that a little bit oh, because yeah. you had some guys, uh, I think in a unit that, or a, or a team that, uh, that were upset because you were pushing too hard, right? right? And so it's intimidating, it's threatening to see their existence too. Yeah, having the SEAL teams. Right. Um, I like it. It shows me who you are as a person. Mm. If you can't sit in a room with me or anybody else a man or a woman to fuck up, I don't need to talk to you. Mm. Because why? My life experience has taught me one thing. David Goggins, you used to be a little fucking pussy. And if you cannot man the fuck up now and talk about what's on your mind and push other men and other women to be better, and if they don't want it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But for me, I know that you have more in there. We are better we are better people from people like me pushing you to a spot. You have two choices. To either hate me like a motherfucker yeah. or to say, hmm, maybe there's something behind this fucking guy. Yeah. That's why I love telling where I came from. If people were just to hear me talk now, I can see how you see I'm an arrogant, pompous, disgusting, fucked up human being. <laughs> Roger that. If they don't see the other side of it. You have to see my childhood. Mm -hmm. You have to see where I come from. You have to see how I talk about myself in the third person back then. How I had to overcome that pussy that I used to be. That lying, that insecure person. To get here now, to now deal with real problems. The person, so a lot of people who are in that bad spot, they can't handle me because they can't deal with real problems. Mm -hmm. If you can't deal with real problems, you're going to definitely hate me. Because how I became myself was dealing with my real problems. Right. And also now what you do with your real problems, you can now see other people's real problems. <laughs> but I mean, what you're doing is you're saying, here, let me shed some light on some things that you know deep down you're already dealing with. That's all I'm doing, man. To recognize. And what people do, they get mad at me <laughs> right. because I just called you the fuck out. Right. And the reason why I'm able to call you the fuck out, because I know what you're fucking thinking, You've man. Been there. I've been there. So I don't talk about anything that I don't know about. I don't just start randomly just having conversations. I'm talking the black and white thing to you right now. Why? I'm a black man that lived in white America and got called nigger more times than I can fucking count. Got spray painted nigger. If, if anybody should hate white people forever, it's me. It is me. I got fucking spray painted nigger in my car, got in my fucking notebooks everywhere. Everywhere in my life. The Klan marched down the fucking street in the 4th of July parade of where I lived in 1995. Mm. I used to despise white people. 
And it's that same fucking stupid ignorance that I had that drove me into a spot of being, of not being successful, of being shackled by a while. And guess what? You know what the funny thing about this shit is? I've had a few people come to my rescue in my life. All of them have been white. Mm. White men. All of them have been white men. So if I'm not man enough to sit here as a black man and look at that shit, I'm not calling black men out. I'm just saying so happened to be there's been three white men when I was in the lowest part of my life that said, you know what, man? I see value in you. Hmm. And they said, I'm going to help you out. Who are those people? One guy's name is Steve Wazowski, Navy SEAL. Another guy's name is um, Scott Guerin. Scott Guerin was an uh, Air Force pararescueman back in the day that I was like fucking 16 years old, 14, 15 years old. I was in PJOC. I was in high school. And I only met him for like two weeks, pretty much. And it's, it's, it's in my book. It's actually yeah, in my audio book. That's right, yeah. And I searched this guy. I literally called him up, $500 fucking phone bill. $500 phone bill, man. Trying to search this guy out, man. Literally, in seeking this guy out. He knew me for one week. Couldn't even really remember me. And I said, hey, man, can I come stay with you, man? Guy didn't know who the fuck I was. Really? I flew out to Key West and stayed with him for two weeks. And he didn't say too much to me, but you know, it's just those kind of situations right there that I can count on one hand. And there's good people out there in the world, man, of all colors. And we have to open our minds up to all this shit, man. Sure. We have to. Yeah. It's important. Well, and it's powerful. I mean, you, what, what, what opportunities and conversations and That's right. opportunities for growth are you missing when you close Huge. yourself off that way? Huge. And I closed myself off my junior year completely. And I realized, you know, so you have to be honest with yourself, dude. You have to be honest with yourself, all this shit. All the hate you feel for, the, for another person or hate you feel for yourself. Once you accept all that shit and you know, hey man, this, this fucking shit's fucking toxic. Mm -hmm. It's fucking toxic. And you're not gonna get any growth from it. All you do is become more and more ignorant. And trust me, man, you, you fall down a rabbit hole of being so fucking stupid that you, you, you can't ever climb out of it. Mm. So that, that's, that's what it's about. That's what it's about, man. Call yourself out for what you are, for whatever you're going through in life. Bring it to the surface and fix those fucking issues, man. And I challenge people to do that. You know? So people. Right. People. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody <laughs> can do right. that. You know? One of the things that I liked a lot about what you said, I think this was towards the end of the book, is you talk about being, and I, I you're gonna have to correct me if I butcher the term, but peaceful but never satisfied. Right. I think that's a good place to kind of wind this down a little bit because I think there's a lot of guys who haven't been able to find the right blend of that, mm -hmm. right? They're either content and satisfied so much that they aren't willing to push, right? or they're pushing so hard for something and they can never be satisfied or happy with what they've achieved so far. Right. How does a man find that? So for me, how, how I found peace was through my story, going back through my life, seeing where I came from and where I'm at now, seeing that journey. But the thing about it is you have to see the journey. First of all, you have to start your journey. And many of us think because we're born into this world that we have started our journey. Mm. No, it's not it, man. That's not it. It's not that simple. I wish it was that simple. Um, many people have died and lived to be 100 fucking years old and never started their journey. That journey starts when you start to meet yourself at that battle. When you start to battle yourself and start to break down those walls that you in society start to build in your own mind. Once you start to break down those walls, you've now started your journey. Mm -hmm. Your journey has to be hard at first to get through the other side to find peace. But what happens to a lot of us is, even happened to me, it happened, I, so I had to become sick. God made me sick and I couldn't run. I couldn't, I couldn't push anymore. So I had a lot of time to think about my life. And I never reflected back through reflections where you find peace. I never reflected back on that shit. I never reflected back on where I came from and where I'm at now. And, all the things that overcame. You have to slow your life down enough to respect what you've done for yourself. All the things you overcome. So to find peace, you need reflection. Mm. 
You need a lot of reflection to go back through and respect the journey. So through there, you find your peace. Now, to go back to the suffering part of life after you find peace, it's important because why? You can't ever think that you've arrived. There must always be growth. Like right now, I'm talking about the black and white issue, gay and lesbian, whatever the fuck you're dealing with issue. There's so much growth in that. There's so much growth in going back, like going back to school, going back to get more education, learning, learning another culture, learning. It's just about constantly immersing yourself in something that you're just not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It's not about running a lot of miles. It's not about, you know, going back to these hard fucking like crucibles of like doing all these different challenges physically. A lot of the hardest challenges in the world are mental challenges of trying to be a better person. Like for instance, man, I talked to this guy the other day, man, just to bring up another race issue. He's like, hey man, like I, I gotta be honest with you, man. Like I was born hating black people. Mm. And he, he, he goes, hey, I, he goes, How, he go, are you able to take this conversation? I go, yeah, what's up, man? He goes, you're, you're my mentor. And I, and I have to tell you this, man, because you know, I, I grew up calling black people nigger. Hmm. And he goes, and he looked at me, he goes, I, I hope that you don't hate me now. I go, you know how much fucking courage it took for you? I go, motherfucker, I respect you more now than fucking ever. I don't, I don't even know who the fuck you are, but now I respect you. Yeah. Because if you walk up to me and tell me this, that I'm your mentor, and then almost start crying to me, because for 30 years of your life, you made black jokes, called black people out of their fucking name, called them nigga. Now you're talking to a black man who was called nigga more times than I can count. You're telling me that, please don't hate me now, but you are, you are now my mentor. Mm -hmm. That's growth. That's the suffering. You know, that's, that's part of the, you know, maturing in life that I'm talking about. We, you know, so that's the going back and trying to always fix yourself. You're not, you're not always fixed. Through finding peace, you're proud of yourself. It doesn't mean that you're totally fixed and you're all good and everything is great and now I've arrived and I can be comfortable. No, man, it means that you're proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. But in being proud of yourself, take that time to say, okay, man, but I'm still fucked up in a lot of fucking areas. And that's that going back and constantly going back through that and fixing yourself. Yeah. So what's, uh, so what's next for you then? I mean, I know you've always got something going, talking about the race that you're going to do again. I mean, what else? What else can we expect from you? Honestly, right now, uh, it's, it's getting back to the start line of that race. Mm -hmm. um, I've, uh, I've applied to be a... You know, I'm not even going to talk about that right now because I don't feel like fucking getting into that. But <laughs> I've uh, going back to Badwater, um, try, trying to get out there to that race again. That, that was the last 100 miler or over I've done. And that was 2014. Right. That means a lot to me. I want my, my, my ultra running career to end on a note of me saying, hey, man, my health got the best of me. Um, and honestly, just trying to better myself every day, man. You know, that's, that's the big thing for me. And I'm lucky at 44 Whatever comes to my mind, I do. So I don't have anything that I regret. I'm not sitting at 44 saying, man, I wish I should did that, man. Is. Fuck, I should have done No, I'm at 44 now thinking, man, all right, man, what the fuck am I going to do? Like right now, I know that um, I'm going to be getting into fighting a little bit more, jiu-jitsu. Oh, is that right? Yep, I'm going to be nice. getting into that a little bit more. Uh, I promised Joe Rogan I'll start dabbling on that a little yeah. bit. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to dabbling on that. I have the right mentality, right mindset. I've been fighting for years, you know, I don't, I don't know karate, but I know crazy, as Jane Brown said. <laughs> so I've been, I've been fighting for, I have a good mentality, a good heart mentality, but I need to learn some technique. Sure. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to dive into that. Dive You're going to join the, uh, the hunting community anytime soon? Definitely. I That's saw you, thing. I saw you shooting the bow with Cameron. Cameron. Yeah. So I love the bow. I actually took on that pretty nicely. Yeah. Uh, me and him, you know, we'll get out and we'll, you know, we'll attack that. But, sure. Um, I, will, I will definitely dabble into that. And um, just continue spreading the message. I mean, whoever wants to listen to it, you know, I won't be doing it a lot, but you know, I pick my moments where I'll talk my bullshit and I go back into hiding. And <laughs> people get tired of hearing my little raspy, fucked up voice, and I go back into hiding, man. Do what I do, man. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. Well, as we wind down, let me ask you a question I prepped you for a little bit, and that question is, what does it mean to be a man? It means everything to me. It means everything to me. It is the ultimate in sacrifice. What I, what I believe it means to be a man, I believe it means to be, it's that motherfucker 
who people shouldn't understand. It's that guy that literally puts everything before himself. Everything before himself. Family, response, literally you are, you're the foundation. Which is why I talk about you have to make sure that you're ready to be a man and have a family and, and take on these responsibilities of life because you literally have to shoulder so much of the suffering. You don't want to see your wife suffer. You don't want to see your kids suffer. Yeah, there's a point with, with kids. Kids have to learn a little bit of suffering. Sure. It's important. But you want to make sure you have the answers. If you don't have the answers, you make sure that you know how to get the answers. You want to make sure that you have the money. You want to make sure that you don't put your family in a situation that they're in dire straits or, or, or you make these fucked up moves. And so it's the biggest responsibility in the fucking world. It is the biggest responsibility in the fucking world, which is why I'm always talking about be uncomfortable. Do something that sucks every day because you're constantly trying to sharpen that sword as a man. And the sword is your fucking brain because you have to shoulder more than your share of the fucking task. 100% and then some all the time. So what it means to be a man, it means everything. It means not sleeping sometimes. It means fucking sometimes, you know, you go without to make sure that your family goes forward. And if not your family, maybe you're in combat. Maybe you're in a situation. You, you have to always make sure that you're doing for others before you do for yourself. But to do that, you got to make sure you are a hard motherfucker. Because only a hard motherfucker can do that. Only a hard motherfucker can be in a situation that says, hey, man, I'm at Ranger School right now. We're all fucking hungry as shit. And we're all men out here. But guess what, brother? Take that, man. You, you look like you need it more than me. And you're starving. Your stomach's fucking inside out. You lost 56 pounds and you're dying inside. But a man looks at another motherfucker and says, hey, man, fucking take that, brother. Hmm. So a man, in other words, is a fucking leader. A man's a leader. So, and that is the fucking hardest thing. And a leader is a motherfucker, man. Is a, you're oftentimes unhappy. People don't like you. People fucking hate you. People do not understand you, but you always have to make a fucking the best decision. And that takes a lot of balls. It's powerful. It's powerful. Well, I think everybody listening probably knows how to somewhat connect with you, but remind <laughs> us anyways, how do we connect with you? Pick up a copy of the book, find out what you're doing, at least until you go into hiding again. Right. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you when you come back out, I guess. So all my um, social media shit is like at, it's at David Goggins. Um, and also my book, it says it's self-published, it's Amazon. Go to Amazon for the book. Audible has the audio book. Um, the audio book, just by the way, if, if you guys don't already know, is amazing because it's the book, but then it's an interview slash podcast. It's got right. a bunch of extras, so really, really cool. I listened to the, uh, that while I was running a lot, so very cool. And also for the audio book, it's the first time that's ever been done. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I didn't self-publish, so also be your own creator. Yeah, yeah. Because if I didn't self-publish and I went with the fucking publishing house, they would have never. That option would not have been on never. You're going to read this fucking book and that's it. Right. So, you know, make sure you put yourself in a situation where you can kind of own your own life. So you can own your own creativity and have your own life and, and be who you need to be. So, yeah, it's um, David Goggins, at David Goggins for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and my audio book. And my book is uh, audio books at Audible. And my book is um, on Amazon. Right on. We'll right. connect it all up so the guys have it. I just I want to let you know, man, what an honor it is to come up here and talk with you. Uh, you've inspired me. You've motivated me. Uh, you've called me out indirectly on some of my own bullshit, which has helped me be a better man. I so I want to let you know I appreciate you and all that you've done in your life because it's inspired me to be better in mine. That's humbling to me, man. I appreciate that. Thank you for being uh, for being honest like that, bro. Thank you. Right on.